Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laura Moses, a member of the Green Sanctuary Committee, filling in for Simon Lewis this morning. And before I introduce today's speaker, I want to invite you to join us after the forum for our Earth Day service, which begins at 11 with guest speaker Marilyn Hemingway. And I'm going to paste that link into the chat. Um, today's speaker is Cyrus Buffum. He's a commercial oyster man, a natural historian, and an environmental advocate. He is the founder of Charleston Waterkeeper and the co-founder of Friends of Gadsden Creek. Cyrus, welcome to the forum and thank you for being here. And everyone else, please put your questions in the chat and we'll go over them at the end. Thank you, Laura. And thank you everybody for uh, spending your Sunday morning with us. This is quite a treat, um, especially considering the past year and haven't had very little social interaction. Uh, so even if it's over Zoom, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, be in community with you all and uh, for the opportunity to share this, uh, what, what I deem to be an incredibly important story and an inc incredibly important dimension of this place, um, uh, this place of Charleston. So with Laura's permission, I will share the screen and get, get going. Does that work? Great. Okay, so. All right. And just as a, um, it might be an assumption that all of us young folks are technologically savvy, but I might be the exception to the rule. So I uh, appreciate everyone's patience as we get off to the races, but I think we're here. So uh, great, thumbs up from Laura. So today's presentation um, is entitled Gadsden Creek Witness to Robbery. And um, throughout today's uh, talk, what, what I want you all to consider um, is that notion of robbery and, and how we define robbery or theft um, in, in kind of a, in a vernacular context. And that's typically the act of taking something um, without one's permission and, um, you know, or without one's consent. So I want, I want that to kind of sit in the back of your minds as I, as I present um, today. So this is, this is a story about not just a creek, but more importantly about a community um, and the relationship between that creek and that natural resource and, um, and this community, the community specifically uh, being called Gadsden Green. Now the Gadsden Green community um, uh, is, was a general geographic area uh, historically. Today, the term Gadsden Green is oftentimes synonymous with a very specific uh, territory of housing. Um, but to give you all a sense of what we're going to be talking about today, let's first center ourselves geographically. This is the Gadsden Creek area. Um, a few landmarks to note. And Laura, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my cursor moving around? Okay. So my cursor in the upper left hand screen of, um, uh, of this slide here, that's the, the River Dogs baseball stadium. So for you all to kind of get that centering point, we're on the west side of the peninsula and the downtown peninsula. This lower left hand corner section body of water is the Ashley River. We have Brittle Bank Park right here. And then over to the right, kind of the upper right hand corner, you see two baseball diamonds. That's a park known as Harmon Field. Um, and where this creek is, where Gadsden Creek is, as it exists today, is right where this arrow points. So you can see a bunch of surface parking. Uh, you see buildings over here by the, the baseball stadium. And then you see a bunch of what looks to be vegetation. Vegetation starting at this intersection here, which is uh, Fishburn Street headed to east west and then Haygood Avenue headed north south. This vegetation, you can see it kind of uh, straddles both sides of Haygood and comes south, comes south, and then it moves quite abruptly to the west and that vegetation continues, 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 and then it, it, it kind of disappears under Lockwood Boulevard right here and then it, it continues out uh, into the Ashley River. Now that vegetation, what we're looking at, it's hard to tell from a satellite, but what we're actually seeing is we're seeing the vegetation of a salt marsh environment of a of a tidal creek that is um, you know no more uh, that is probably the most low country um, of scenes that we have 
uh, here, here um, you know, in Charleston. These are a few images that were taken by a friend of mine um, called Blake Suarez over the past couple of years of some sites of that area, of that kind of vegetated area that is Gadsden Creek. Um, so in the upper left hand corner, of course, we see some blackberry brambles. We see a fledgling in this next slide. We see some oysters that are actually in the creek, in, in Gadsden Creek. And you'll note kind of a translucent crown on the top of these oysters. That's all new growth. Uh, in the springtime, uh, or excuse me, in the fall, after these animals, after oysters have stopped their spawning, they'll actually start growing quite dramatically uh, to the point where if you look at an oyster bed, if you look at a cluster of oysters in the fall and in the winter while they're really growing before they hibernate, you'll see this beautiful crown um, and that's all brand new shell that's being, um, you know, that's been converted from their, you know, their food source into their, their exoskeleton. Then you have what is my favorite plant, you, this, this uh, yellow daisy looking plant that's called sea oxide, which only grows at the high tide line. We have a little, uh, a little filler crab. We have a uh, couple of egrets here, and we have uh, a heron on that, that last slide. So that gives you a sense of what Gadsden Creek looks like today. But in order to understand how we've gotten there, you know, where, where uh, it's, it's critical to understand where we came from. So let's begin the story in 1822. Uh, and we begin it here kind of arbitrarily. If we had more visuals, we could begin the story uh, in 1000 AD, we could begin the story in 1500 AD and, and show the um, indigenous population's connection and relationship with Gadsden uh, Creek inevitably because of its, its plethora of shellfish and fish and crabs. Um, and it's serving as a piece of connective tissue to the tributaries of the Low Country. So this is an overlay of a plat from 1822. Might be hard to really tell, but we have here the headwaters of Gadsden Creek that kind of meander down. And if you can't quite tell what uh, is below that in the current um, geography, we see Johnson Haygood Stadium. We see Stony Field in, over here. Uh, we're migrating southward. This is all Harmon Field. Uh, and then we start getting into the Gadsden Green community. And then if this plat were to have continued to the south and southwest, we would actually see that the creek joins in with its current footprint. Um, now, where, you know, what the, um, you know, an important thing to know is in 1822, this whole area, much of this area was farmland. Uh, much of this area was, was, was not a part of the, you know, the quote unquote city limits, um, you know, the, the, depending on what time one measures, uh, you know, that was either, uh, no further north than the walled city, the original walled city, city, and then eventually no further north than what we refer to as Calhoun Street, which was originally called Boundary Street, the northern boundary of, of the city. Um, and so this land was owned by a, a gentleman called Thomas N. Gadsden. Um, so now we understand where the name Gadsden Creek came from. Thomas N. Gadsden was uh, the city of Charleston's auctioneer of enslaved peoples. Uh, if you were to look at archives, if you were to look at old newspaper clippings, you would, um, you would find notices and advertisements um, uh, uh, promoting uh, auctions of entire families of individuals um, at the hands of, of Thomas N. Gadsden. So that's, that's um, an, an important kind of grounding component to understand, you know, where much of this history begins. Um, the next visual that we really have as kind of a, a you know, a excuse me, went too far, um, as a, a point of reference is this one, this plat from 1852. And the reason why I think this is helpful is because it shows the relationship eventually after Thomas Gadsden passed away and his estate subdivided much of those holdings, the holdings um, were, uh, were subdivided to be individual single family parcels. And you could see the, the relationship between these individual parcels and the creek itself, uh, you know, talk about, you know, talk about waterfront property um, and marshfront property. The way that this site was was planned, now in theory, was such that you had uh, home sites that would have this very intimate relationship with with the creek. Um, the next real visual cue that that we have that we've been able to gather uh, is thanks to um, Dr. Nick Butler at uh, Charleston County Library. And um, Nick was able to find this slide in, in some of the archives. 
And this is a slide of a, of a baptism with a caption on, on the right hand um, sh showing April 1st, 1867, Gadsden's Green uh, with some initials. Um, after Nick and I talked about it, you know, he, he felt quite confident that this um, is depicting an actual baptism um, uh, with high probability of the Gadsden Green community that began to settle around Gadsden Creek after uh, or during Reconstruction. Um, and, and what is either kind of the mouth of Gadsden Creek and this is perhaps the Ashley River, but that general vicinity. And to again, kind of give you a centering um, image, you can see here, this is a bird's eye view, we're looking west towards the Ashley River uh, along the top here. And um, they've kind of, you know, the artist is, it's not perhaps quite to scale, the, the creeks aren't exact, but you get a sense of this being Gadsden Creek. You see Chestnut Street, which is today's Haygood Avenue, and it dead ends, Chestnut Street dead ends, right, kind of at this you know, this uh, meandering portion of Gadsden Creek right here. And you can see, you know, palatial uh, farm uh, properties up here, but then you have this, this very traditional urban grid that, that we see everywhere in Charleston. We see blocks of streets, we see single family houses, and how this section of town, again, this would have been kind of just outside the city limits, how this section of town was set, settled was a blend of um, industrial and residential use. So these are a few uh, clippings that, that uh, I've been able to find over the years that kind of show that blending use of, um, of the Gadsden Green area. The Gadsden Green area, again, being this general vicinity around Gadsden Creek. This, this top clipping um, talks about a, um, uh, a lot of land lying on the west side of Chestnut Street, again, today's Haygood Avenue, near the west end of Spring Street abutting on Gadsden's Creek with a good wharf and landing measuring 200 feet on Chestnut Street, et cetera, et cetera. The important part about this, um, and, and this was a part of a lumber yard, is it shows the extent of Gadsden Creek in 1872. For there to have been a wharf, for there to have been a landing, for there to have been ample water access for ships to be able to, or boats to be able to, to, to bring lumber into this lumber yard from uh, up the Ashley River to be processed in this mill and then probably to be shipped back out. It speaks to the substantial size and uh, importance of Gadsden Creek. Now to contrast that with then the human element, the more residential element, we see a tragic story just below that uh, of a young boy drowning um, after falling into Gadsden Gadsden Creek, um, young African-American boy. Um, and then we see kind of to the next column over to the right, uh, this again speaks to the industrial nature of Gadsden, the Gadsden Green area, talking about a steam engine being, um, being erected uh, in that area. Perhaps it had something to do with the, the mill, um, perhaps it was another entity. Um, and then um, another interesting note is not only was it kind of industrial, um, you know, lumber and, and boat and such, but the importance of Gadsden Creek is revealed in this next, um, this next clipping that shows that um, all of the butcher and slaughter pens were, uh, you know, were, were in that area. Um, and that was what is referred to as butcher town. So why would the, the, the butcheries and um, uh, the abattoirs and the slaughterhouses, why would they have been erected on the banks of a creek? Well, you know, before plumbing, before uh, waste management infrastructure was in place, a creek that had significant tidal flow would have been a very advantageous partner in, in a, a process such as this, where you could dispose of the refuse, dispose of the things that were not used as part of the, the butchery process, and the tide um, hopefully would, would take that out and, um, and, and remove it for you. Um, this other kind of point, and this, this, you know, if th this should hopefully really paint this contrasted image of how this place was used. Um, it shows that um, after, and, and this article came about, um, um, this, this bottom article came about after um, several boys, and it's, it's presumed that these are African American boys and young children, um, were arrested for swimming uh, in front of areas they, it was undesirable by others, according to others, um, for, for them to swim in front of. And so the city of Charleston, in cooperation with the police, 
they established several designated places where the youth, these young children, were able to bathe, um, where they were able to, you know, to enjoy the water, um, either for, you know, for hygiene or for recreation. And you can note that um, uh, one of the places uh, established was uh, Gadsden's Creek. And so this kind of shows uh, that that relationship, you know, that relationship between the residents, which were primarily African American, and kind of the city's view of that area. It was always, um, you know, at least in the early 19th century, it was it was a place for for industry. Um, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, um, and it was where some of these more unsavory industries would would exist. Now we go from uh, Reconstruction, where you know some of these privileges were granted and protected um, you know, for the residences in, in that area, albeit segregated, um, to then the era of Jim Crow. And, and this is an important transition because we can really begin to see, um, you know, see a, a, a tone shift. Um, in 1891, the, um, the city lists um, no less than six butchers surrounding the, the streets of the Gadsden Green area. Um, this is again on the, the bottom of the left-hand side. This is Gadsden's Creek. And we can see the lumber wharf. If, if this Sanborn map were to have been zoomed out, we could probably see um, more and more of these other industries, perhaps some of the, the butcher shops. Uh, we see a slaughterhouse right here, actually, now that I'm saying this. And then the D, these are all dwelling homes. So these would have been very traditional Charleston single houses. You see the dwelling house with the, with the backs in addition, perhaps off the back. And then we see these, these very classic um, southward facing porches, right, of, of Charleston. Um, a few other important notes um, from a timing standpoint uh, is 1911, what we refer to as Burke High School, then Charleston Industrial School con constructed uh, a beautiful brick building at its current location, uh, which would have been just to the north of Harmon Field. So within a, a very capable person's um, throw of a, of a baseball perhaps um, to the creek and um, you know the, the headwaters of the creek and the marsh itself that abuts the creek would have been right on one side of Harmon Field and then you would have had Burke High School um, this institution for the African-American residents uh, of, of the peninsula of Charleston right on the other side and eventually by 1912 kind of leading up to World War um, you have Butchertown gradually migrated northward. And this was in anticipation of growth. The city of Charleston was growing um, despite us being in and around the, you know, the, 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 the war years, the years leading up to the Great Depression, um, but the city anticipated growth. And in anticipation of those, that growth, um, the city, uh, and again, keep in mind, we're in the midst of Jim Crow, the city um, engaged with a, um, a consulting group um, out of Philadelphia called Morris Knowles. And uh, Morris Knowles published on behalf of the city a report that is known as the Knowles Report. Um, this was, I only recently discovered this, and this kind of um, confirmed our suspicion that what we're living with today in, in uh, the sense of uh, West Edge and in the sense of the city's treatment of um, of the Gadsden Green community is a function of a plan that was put in place in 1931 and at least memorialized in 1931. Um, and, uh, and we've been living with the momentum of that plan ever since. So here are two really important slides as, as it relates to Gadsden Creek and the story of, of the Gadsden Green community. On the left-hand uh, image, the left-hand image is a, um, uh, shows distribution of the population as it exists in 1931. Every black circle, uh, shaded in circle, uh, denotes, I believe it's 10 African-American residents. Every uh, circle that is not shaded in denotes 10 white residents. So you can see here the Gadsden Green area, again, this area surrounding Gadsden Creek is uh, nearly exclusively African-American um, in terms of its composition. The city in the Knowles report then um, on the next page said, well, this is our estimated ultimate distribution of, po of population. This is our desired population distribution of the area. We see two very striking things. The first striking note is that, you know, that Gadsden Green remains predominantly, if not exclusively African-American, but then the other uh, more alarming component is that 
uh, all of that marshland that would have been to the west of Gadsden Green. Again, Gadsden Green was the westernmost of the residences, residential areas of the peninsula, you know, uh, uh, with respect to Gadsden Creek. All of that marsh and all of this creek that we're in this left slide, we don't see any sort of um, population. In 1931, they envisioned that going away somehow, right? How would that happen? And only white residents living there. And not only only white residents living there, but if you look at the distance between these white circles, we can assume based on the population density assumptions of you know a single circle that um, these would be quite um, quite nice lots. These would be very large lots. These would be um, you know quite quite spread out. Um, right on the Ashley River, you know, that granted in order to do this, um, all of this marsh and all this creek would have to go away. Um, so that's a very important, and, and I want you, um, everyone to, you know, to keep this, this contrast in their heads, that this is what it looked like in 1931 from a population distribution. This was the city's desire um, as early as 1931. And I want you to kind of consider how that has all played out into modern time, into today's time. So uh, oftentimes hard to kind of, to imagine what things actually look like. And fortunate for us, we, we have this photograph, uh, this aerial photograph from 1934. And this is a bird's eye perspective. This is looking west. Um, this is Harmon Field. Again, this is the kind of the edge of Burke High School over here to the right. Um, and then this is all Gadsden Creek. All of this marsh would, is um, the marsh between this community, the Gadsden Green community, and the Ashley River, which is just to the out of slide, but it would appear on the upper left-hand corner and kind of run diagonally along the, um, the screen. Now, some really important parts to, to note here. Again, considering that this was um, predominantly, if not exclusively populated by African-American residents, we also know that this looks like anywhere in downtown Charleston. You see single houses, you see um, the rhythm of houses on the uh, you know, zero lot line, um, uh, uh, right along the, you know, the, the shared common street. We also see the relationship between these streets and the creek. You know, we see the width of the creek. If we were to, to zoom in, we would actually be able to see a dock in some areas. There's boats over here. Um, this would have been, a community that was deeply connected to uh, this natural resource, natural resource for sustenance, for from from standpoint of food, um, uh, a, a relationship that uh, that existed um, because of the creek serving as transportation. Just on the other side of the Ashley River, you had the Maryville community, another uh, African American um, settlement, African American community. And um, you know, before bridges, before roads, and and, and such, um, Gadsden Creek would have been the artery to connect the West Side communities, African American communities, to the communities west of the Ashley. Um, so you know, you have this you know very very important relationship and very very important dynamic that exists. So this 1934 slide is is critical. Um, if we go back to the name of the presentation, um, because this shows what once was. This shows what was the, the baseline state of the Gadsden Green community uh, with respect to its relationship with Gadsden Creek, its relationship with, um, you know, with, with other assets within the community. And I want us to kind of take stock of those assets, of the resources that, um, that were shared and, um, and enjoyed by residents of Gadsden Green. We already spoke about the natural assets here of Gadsden Creek. We have this public asset here, this green space, which is Harmon Field. Harmon Field was deeded specifically to the children of, of the African-American children of, of Charleston um, by the Harmon Foundation, hence its name, um, Harmon Field. Harmon Foundation was founded um, uh, uh, in the early 1900s by a real estate developer in New York um, and he, recognized through some life experiences that he had the disproportionate allocation of resources that exist existed and exists uh, in this country um, between the white population and and its black population um, uh, much of the the you know the the philanthropic support that the Harmon Foundation um, uh, participated in was 
to either the arts and much uh, much of their work was was kind of behind the scenes of the Harlem Renaissance, much of their financial work, um, and also in creating green spaces. Um, the Harmon Field donation was the first and, and largest donation in the South for the Harmon Foundation, but it explicitly noted that this be forever a green space for recreation for Charleston's African-American community um, to be a playground. Um, and then just to the north of Harmon Field, we have Burke High School. And so you, uh, and, and then of course, kind of um, distributed throughout, one can imagine corner stores where one could buy provisions, um, you know, all the needs of the community, right? And, and that's important because as, as we begin to kind of um, be, begin seeing the debiting of the, uh, oh, and it's, it sounds like somebody has uh, unmuted. Okay, good. Thanks, Laura. Um, so where, where kind of this story, so this is kind of what was in the bank account, what was in the communal bank account beginning in 1934. And I want us to kind of continue to keep that, um, have that, you know, frozen on your minds as we kind of move forward into modern day over the, the, the you know, next 80, uh, 80, 90 years. So the next kind of the real important piece of, um, you know, of this, what I would deem to be a tragic story um, is a violent story um, occurs in 1938 when two tornadoes rip through downtown Charleston. You have one tornado that, um, that kind of sweeps through uh, northeast early direction um, on the northern side of the peninsula and you have another that kind of that, that skirts the southern edge of you know the business district of and the south of broad district of the peninsula um, here's kind of a contrast of the damage so the the top slide of 45 state street shows uh, a, a building or perhaps several buildings completely blown over um, on that southern uh, district of the peninsula and then on this um, next slide or this next image, we see uh, a, a building toppled over on Fishburn Street. Um, there was more loss of life on this due to the Southern tornado. Um, there was more loss of property due to the Southern tornado. Um, the, the Northern tor tornado um, largely damaged, um, you know, the only real community that was there, which was the Gadsden Green community. Um, what happened simultaneously? Again, let's keep in mind that 1931 image uh, of the city's desired uh, um, uh, distribution of population. The city quickly um, took advantage of this environmental disaster and accessed uh, funds from uh, US, in, US Housing Administration um, in order to build um, housing um, in the place of all of those single family homes that were there that were part of Gadsden Green. Um, and this is a this kind of bottom left hand corner. This is just a timeline from the Housing Authority's 75th anniversary program celebrating the, the works of the Housing Authority. An interesting thing to note is less than, you know, three weeks after or about three weeks after the tornadoes, um, the city quickly enacted this, this kind of or, uh, received this financial windfall um, suggesting that you know that would be used to you know to 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 repair and to address some of the damages. Now, unbeknownst to the community, and over here to the right that we see this um, uh, this clipping, this is a month after or you know a couple of weeks after that uh, that windfall um, from the U.S. Housing Administration. Residents of the Gadsden Green community were um, uh, were planning fundraisers in order to help its community rebuild. Now, again, in the midst of Jim Crow, um, conventional financing to repair properties would not have been available to African-American residents. Um, so what did the community have to rely on? One another, just as, you know, just as the community had, had always done. Um, uh, another important kind of centering part is after the tornadoes, you can see here, soup kitchens and sleeping accommodations for homeless were set up at the Negro Fair building on Harmon Field. So again, Harmon Field, a place for uh, the Gadsden Green community. This is a really, really important kind of piece because it shows the, uh, the deliberate and the violent uh, taking of these assets that we saw in that early 1930s uh, aerial view from the Gadsden Green community. So unbeknownst to the community, the city begins this process to uh, seize all of those single family homes from the Gadsden Green residents, whether or not they were entirely uh, destroyed 
um, and, um, and condemn every single one of those homes. This is a letter that we found in the archives at the city of Charleston's archives from 38, 39, 40 residents um, of the Gadsden Green community after learning about the city's plans to condemn all of these homes, uh, this entire community and to convert it into a low rent district segregated housing, which we now call Gadsden Green public housing. Um, and you can see here in the second paragraph, um, you know, after the city had obviously proposed that this is a quote slum district, that was, that was verbiage that was um, specifically used during urbanization in the early 20th century, kind of early, early to mid 20th century to justify the takings of these communities. Um, uh, Robert Moses in New York is infamous for, for using kind of this quote unquote justifiable language of, of a district being a slum or a neighborhood being a slum to justify um, uh, its taking, to justify its destruction, all for either highways or in this case, a, a segregated housing complex. Um, and so you could see the residents here protesting that point. This is not a slum district. Um, the second point that they make is 75% of the people living in the affected area are either buying or own their home, right? Home ownership, that means equity. That means generational wealth, right? Um, the third point is after a careful survey, 80% of the homes are in good repair, um, meaning that you know the, the damage done um, uh, was either already addressed or, um, was only affecting 20% of the structures. Um, and then a final part, and this is the most, most damning, um, uh, that this is, and this is the third, uh, or excuse me, the fourth point, that this is the largest group of colored property owners in any single area in the city of Charleston. If we are forced to give up our homes at this time, it will be the greatest tragedies to befall an unfortunate people. With most of our earning power on the wane, we will not be able to get out and face the world again, trying to buy homes with sacrifices and privations that we once suffered. So what were they talking about, right? They were talking about this. This is, a, uh, this is the deed to my property um, where I live. And uh, I discovered this after, uh, after buying the property um, and, um, read and, and doing kind of a historical title search. This is what John Harris and the residents of Gadsden Green were talking about. This restrictive co covenant that is, that is still on my property today, granted it's no longer legal, says, quote, none of the said lots above described shall be sold, devised, mortgaged, donated, rented, or otherwise disposed of to any person or persons of African descent, nor to any corporation whose stock is controlled by stockholders of such descent, provided, however, that household servants employed on the premises may occupy servants' quarters thereon signed by, and this was uh, J.C. Long, um, was the president of this real estate company, and that name may ring a bell of being the founder of the Beach Company um, and, and some of their relationships with the city of Charleston. Um, so despite these, these cries and, and these, these, these protests um, by the Gadsden Green community, um, the, the city continued forward with that vision, this 1931 vision to um, um, you know, to, to quote, quote, develop this area. Um, and so all of these homes were taken. Uh, the Gadsden Green housing complex was created. Residents went from owning homes and owning and, and building equity to then a subservient uh, dynamic whereby they were renting from uh, a housing authority controlled by the city of Charleston. And again, this is, this was segregated. So the, um, uh, you know, the attentions given to white public housing versus the attentions given to black public housing was very different uh, as well. Um, we get into the 1940s um, and we're getting into the, the war years. And this again is kind of a, a, a less dramatic, less um, violent, less obvious form of takings, less obvious form of robbery, but just it kind of illustrates another more subtle, a bit more passive um, way to do so is um, when the US Army solicited the city of Charleston's help in finding a, um, a, a field where soldiers could train, the city of Charleston offered up, the first thing to, that they offered was Harmon Field. You know, this was, uh, again, you know, a field that was for the African-American population. Um, that was the city's first offering, is here, use this field, um, despite the Harmon Foundation's insistence that this be forever used as a playground, as a place of, of peace and recreation. Um, the Harmon Foundation found out about this 
And uh, this is a Western Union saying that, um, uh, you know, in view of large number of protests from citizens and interests involved, both white and colored, we cannot consent to transfer of the playground, this is Harmon Field, for army use. Um, and so subsequently, what the city then said is, okay, Stony Field, um, which is this quote on the right hand side. Um, but what they also said in their lease agreement that they drafted up for the Department of Army, Army said that uh, that condition number five is that the use of the property shall be restrict strictly limited to soldiers of the white or Caucasian race. Um, so just another example of not only did the, the city attempt to take this space from, uh, from the African American community, but then once it uh, found a space that wasn't so blatantly taken from the community, they then wanted to limit its use um, to, um, you know, to only those of, of white residents. Uh, a couple of other things just in this area, end of World War II, of course, 1945, 1948 Johnson Haygood Stadium, which is just to the north of Harmon Field is completed, um, but it remained off limits to African American residents um, for another 10, 11 years. Um, and then there is a lot of activity in, in Charleston in the, um, the white democratic parties. Uh, there was redistricting that occurred. There, was, there were population migrations in that, in that time. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of political activity um, uh, and, and, and you know, that, that reveals this, um, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of white um, superiority within the city that was a part kind of of the culture. Um, in the 1950s, despite all of that, that history, um, Gadsden Green, right now being kind of confined to the public housing and then some adjacent blocks, which still had single family houses, um, continued to use and benefit from these community assets from Gadsden Creek over here on the west, the left side, uh, Harmon Field here. And if you were to zoom in, you could, um, these say fairground buildings. And these would have been buildings to support what is shown here in this um, advertisement from Billboard magazine from 1953, um, the Charleston County Colored Farmers Fair. This was an annual tradition um, where the agricultural heritage of Charleston's African American community would be able to be showcased and, and shown off on Harmon Field. Um, we found some really great clippings of, uh, of, of competitions of between you know, who had the largest um, cattle, who had the you know, biggest tomato, et cetera. Um, and yet contrast that against the, the mayor, Mayor Morrison at the time, his perspective of that area. Uh, and he says in 1956, sticking up like a sore thumb in the area are the unsightly fair cattle and poultry buildings. As a matter of fact, fairs, animal exhibits, carnivals and similar activities for which these buildings were constructed should no longer take place in this improved area. Now, improved is a is a sub, very subjective, um, you know, term here. Improved according to the, the the city's vision as laid out in 1931. How are they going to improve this? How are they going to achieve that 1931 vision? They were going to begin by um, undertaking this massive real estate development project, which which required the filling in of all of that creek and all of that marsh, about 100 acres total. And so the city begins starting up here. This is the, the end of Fishburn Avenue. And this was the extension of Chestnut Street here, which then has now become Haygood Avenue. Um, they began filling. They began taking, getting their hands on anything and everything that they could in order to create real estate. Um, this was not a waste management project. This was a land creation project. And you can see these dramatic slides, 1954, the progress made in 1957. These are some comments made by the administration suggesting that 22 acres were created uh, in 1957 of new land and the appraisal is $550,000. The next is this kind of proclamation in 1958 uh, by Mayor Morrison saying we are reclaiming more than 100 acres of marshland. Numerous suggestions have been made to the uses to which these property, properties should be put. Uh, and more and more and more. And so it shows that the, that the intention was always about creating a real estate proposal, a real estate proposition um, to benefit the white residents of the city of Charleston. By 1973, you could see how successful in the eyes of the city that land reclamation project was. Household waste, household trash, dirt, uh, fill dirt from construction sites, uh, uh, demolished buildings, et cetera, everything was, was used to fill in uh, Gadsden Creek. 
Now, if we um, look at the relationship between um, the Gadsden Green public housing complex here, and then what remained of kind of the, the Gadsden Green single family homes here, their relationship with the, with the creek is you know, significantly um, impaired. Now, in this 1950 uh, image, it might be really hard to see, but behind the swimming pool, you can actually begin to see the beginning of trash being piled up behind um, Harmon Field right here and the swimming pool at Harmon Field. And so this shows the disregard of, of, of the humanity of the lives that were living around this area to put 100 acres of trash between this community and the natural world, quite literally creating a wall of, of refuse. Um, 1973, an interesting thing happened, so quite earlier than that, beginning around 1969. Um, the Department of Justice catches wind that the city was doing this and um, they threatened to sue the city for violating the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. Um, because that act st said that you cannot fill in navigable waters, which Gadsden Creek clearly was, um, uh, without, a, without a permit. The city did not have a permit. The city disregarded that this federal law and um, for decades filled in uh, these navigable waters. As part of the set settlement to uh, prevent um, a lawsuit from the Department of Justice, the city agreed to an after the fact permit um, by 1972 or so. Um, that said, okay, we, this was an after uh, the fact permit and this will cover all the activity of the previous decades. Unfortunately, all the damage had been done. You could see this meandering beautiful creek on the left that has this, this you know, composition of any sort of typical tidal creek uh, around the world was then forced into a single canal straightened structure. Um, and that's largely the structure that we have today. Now from 1970s to where we are today, um, there were several attempts made to develop this area. Um, unfortunately for these developers, what was realized is the cost and challenges associated with developing this site because of its uneasiness, because of the de decomposing trash beneath, um, because it's ultimately still a floodplain and still uh, a marsh, just with a bunch of structure on top of it, uh, it was cost prohibitive. So in order to incentivize the actual development, the city of Charleston during the Riley administration um, established a TIF district, um, which would have, um, which which ultimately um, agreed to um, to front the the financial burden of uh, creating all the infrastructure that a developer would need in order to develop such a site, like roads, um, drainage, etc., um, and. Uh, instead of any sort of tax revenues that would come from that project going where our tax revenues, property tax revenues do go, which are a substantial portion are to the Charleston County School District, um, that money would be frozen until the funds that were used to, to develop the infrastructure are paid off. And so that's called the TIF district. And um, that was how uh, what we know as West Edge was incentivized to develop as we the taxpayers have fronted the infrastructure costs of, of this project. Now, what is the project as it exists today? This is the vision from West Edge's website, uh, a, a bunch of kind of luxury condos. Uh, there's a hotel proposed, several, I believe at least one hotel. Um, uh, there's a spa, there's a new Publix here in this lower left-hand corner. Um, there's uh, a rooftop pool of, of luxury apartments and condominiums, you know, very, very, kind of nice quote unquote um, development, but nowhere in this vision do we see Gadsden Creek. Um, and, and the yellow buildings are the buildings that have been erected thus far. The blue buildings are buildings that are already there um, or uh, by the time that this graphic was created. And the orange are proposed buildings. These are buildings that they want to build. Um, and also 15 is one that they want to build. And if we, if we compare that with this 1931 slide, we see that finally, 90 years later, the city has just about realized this vision, uh, largely realized this vision. There's one trouble though, um, the fact that Gadsden Creek still exists. Gadsden Creek is still a tidal creek, still influenced by the Ashley River. It has all of the ecosystem services of any tidal creek on the planet. It, has hab it provides habitat for all a you know, plethora of animals, those we see and those plenty that we do not see. And that area, uh, uh, makes up about four acres. Now those four acres, which is this shaded area, are owned primarily by, by all of us. It's owned by the city of Charleston. 
Um, and yet those four acres are precisely where a lot of these buildings are envisioned to sit. And so what, what has happened is uh, West Edge and the city and, and other uh, financial interests and land holding interests, they've submitted a permit to the Army Corps of Engineers to fill in um, all that remains of Gadsden Creek um, in order to increase the developable square footage by four acres. Um, and what that will allow them to do is put the buildings on the site that are required to produce the property tax revenues that are required to pay off the, um, the debt um, uh, obligation that, that, that you and I as, as, you know, as citizens, as residents of, of the Charleston are all ultimately responsible for. And um, this is kind of the uh, you know, final um, uh, sense of all of the forces that have been exerted on the Gadsden Green community. We have uh, the force of West Edge, which is this kind of red mass here. Blue is, is Gadsden Green. We have uh, this, this transition from single family housing, owning property, uh, building equity, generational wealth, et cetera, to then uh, the dynamic whereby you have uh, renters in uh, substandard conditions um, renting from a housing authority. Um, Harmon Field is still very much there. Burke High School is still very much there, a pillar of the community. Uh, and then, of course, we have Crosstown, which bisected um, what remained of some of these single family um, uh, residential blocks. So looking at where we've come from and where, and by we, ultimately, I, I mean the Gadsden Green community, um, to where we are today, it's a stark difference. Um, and so if we were to imagine this being a bank account and what has been debited from that bank account, what has been taken um, despite protest, despite opposition from the community, what has been taken um, from this community, a significant amount has been taken. And so Friends of Gadsden Creek exists to, um, to elevate and to amplify this story, to ensure that the, the voices of residents today are, are heard and, and amplified. Um, these are some photographs from some of our mutual aid um, events that, that uh, we've hosted at the Gadsden Green community where uh, we've, we've uh, provided food and we've been able to talk to residents about what their concerns are, what their needs are, um, uh, listen to residents and also to share some of this history, some of this you know, history that started well before any human um, began to uh, take place uh, on, on the peninsula, which is the story of this natural world and the story of this natural place. So um, that is, um, that, that is the, the story of Gadsden Creek and the, the story of Gadsden Green. Um, the, uh, the, the, the state of the permit application is such that um, DHEC and the Army Corps has not made an official ruling yet. So things are still up in the air. And if we were to look at, you know, the location of Gadsden Creek. Gadsden Creek is the um, is the the shield. The Gadsden Creek is the uh, the only thing standing between encroachment of the West Edge uh, and this 1931 vision into the Gadsden Green actual community. Um, so that's that's the the story of Gadsden Creek, and um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'm sorry for running a bit over time, but thank, thank you all you. for listening. Thank you, Cyrus. That was so fabulous. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for questions today, but would you like to put your email in the chat and people can contact you directly Absolutely. if they have a question, because that was so informative to get all that background. I really appreciate it. And also, um, I'm going to paste in the chat about our Earth Day service today, which starts at 11 and there's a Zoom link that you can click on and then you'll get a link to the, um, the Unitarian Earth Day service put on by the Green Sanctuary Committee. So again, Cyrus, thank you so much. That was yeah, just thank you. really great background information. And I've got a lot of notes. Thank you, Cyrus. It was a little, very historic for me. Good, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, there's, um, you know, it's critical that, that all the dimensions of Charleston be revealed um, uh, for, especially those of us who have the privilege to to remain um, negligent, or excuse me, uh, uh, unaware of of some of those dimensions, um, because there's a lot of a uh, lot of repair that must be done, and the, the context of the story is one today that demands reparations, that demands you know the root of that is to repair, and if we think about all the damage done um, over 
uh, and just this microcosm of an example, it's been significant um, and, and it all begins and ends with the city of Charleston. So demanding that repairs be made by the city of Charleston to begin equalizing all of those debits that were robbed from the community. All right, well, thank you so much again, Cyrus, and thanks to everybody for showing up and um, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Let's see, I can't end the meeting. I'm gonna stop recording, cancel, stop recording. Yes.